Nine Plus Us presents the Baseball Together podcast with your hosts, Blackjack Brad and Kansas City Little Big Briggy Blue Eyes. And now, Baseball Together. Welcome to the Baseball Together podcast, Baseball Family. I am Brad, and as always, I am joined by Brig. What's up, Baseball Family? And we are here this week to give you more excellent baseball content. This week we're going to talk about Mookie Betts and Dusty Baker, and then we're going to go over a documentary that we love called Fastball. But first, there's something that I would like to get into and go over a little bit for, uh, before we get too much into anything uh, anything else. Uh, I, I didn't want to take too much time on this, um, b- because believe me, I, c- I could, but um, the world lost lost of sports hero this last week. Um, by now, I'm sure everybody knows it's been over a week, um, but Kobe Bryant was, and his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna, and seven others actually were killed in a helicopter crash last week. Uh, my sister first texted me and told me uh, that there was a story developing on this, and uh, she said that Kobe Bryant had had died in a helicopter crash and I didn't believe her because I didn't want to um and mostly because I couldn't but uh over the following days we saw athletes uh across across sports not just basketball but all sports pouring their pouring their hearts out and talking about Kobe's influence I mean we saw Neymar score a goal that day and he he held up 2-4 in respect to Kobe Bryant um we've had a couple couple guys in baseball um, Alex Rodriguez came out and said that Kobe was a like a, a quote unquote secret coach for him when he needed him most at the end of his career. But we had uh, Giancarlo Stanton come out as well, and he gave a little tribute to Kobe, and uh, and he said something that I th- actually thought was was really good. Um, he said, "Thank you, Kobe, for being a superhero to all us kids that grew up in L.A. and across the world. The model of relentless work and dedication that it takes to be on top in any aspect." of life RIP and like I said that that was uh that was John Carlos Stanton so <clears throat> over the last uh last week or so I've listened to a lot of old interviews from Kobe and uh there's 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 two themes that I noticed with both of the, with all those interviews uh first is his generosity okay everybody I've heard from I've ever talked about Kobe said that he was always generous with his time and his knowledge but the thing that will persist through through time is the Mamba mentality. For anyone who's not familiar with the Mamba mentality, like John Carlos Stanton said, it, it's a relentless pursuit of your best self through learning and hard work, learning and applying that. Uh, Brig and I actually had a conversation kind of along those lines a few weeks ago about what we wanted to do with the podcast so we could bring you the best content and so we could make it the best possible way. And without saying the words, but we kind of came to the conclusion that it it's the Mamba mentality, that we have to have the Mamba mentality. And that goes for anything we ever do. Now, talking about Kobe Bryant, we've heard a lot of this this week. Uh, by no means am I applying for sainthood for Kobe being Bryant. Um, he was definitely a flawed man like all of us. But at the same time, uh, as baseball fans, I feel like we can relate to this. Uh, another legend, especially with baseball fans, Babe Ruth said, Heroes get remembered, but legends never die. As some of us mourn the loss of a legend, let's remember that his legacy lives forever in the mom mentality. We can go, we can live by it in anything we do, whether it's business, school, or life in general. So with those, I say rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. So Brig, uh, were you as shocked about about all this as I mean the rest? I mean there is no way to not be shocked, I guess. Yeah, no, as, it's impossible as this not news to be came down. Yeah, but but yeah, something that I thought was really cool. Uh, I mean, you've got to be transcendent to have the tributes that were paid to Kobe Bryant. And, and like I said, it transcends basketball, transcends sports. Uh, I think, was it you who sent me a picture of, of uh, a billboard in Greenville that was a, a tribute to Kobe Bryant? Yeah, they're, they've are they been paying tribute to him all week out here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's we excellent. actually had those We had those in town here as well. And to see something like that spread across, across the country. And, I mean, I don't even live in a basketball town. No, I mean either. And uh, and seeing something like that is is amazing. One of the but things that I thought was really cool. Oh, go ahead. What's that? No, no, no. Go ahead. You're you're fine. Go ahead. I was just gonna say one of the things that I heard was uh, Derek Jeter. Uh, his tribute to Kobe Bryant really touched me. We talk a lot about family here on the podcast, and mm-hmm. Derek Jeter said that of all the conversations that he had with Kobe, the the few 
that he did have, all of them centered around family. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought that was really cool. That was really cool. That's That should be the first thing. And yeah. it sounds like it was, which is awesome. Yep, absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and move on to happier things. Um, Mookie Betts, staying in the news, uh, kind of <laughs> hijacking the headlines from everybody in baseball right now. Um, sure and not is. by his, not by anything he's doing. Um, there's trade rumors just swirling around. They won't stop. Um, does it seem, it seems like there's maybe some significant traction here on this Brig. Uh, what yeah. have you heard on this front as far as, uh, as far as this trade going down? Well, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we've, we know that San Diego is heavily involved in trade discussions, but now as of this, in the last week, we've learned that Los Angeles, that the Dodgers also are heavily discussed and have been super involved in discussions about trading for Mookie Betts. This I did not know. And when I told you mm-hmm. about it, I thought, I, you know, I was, I, it was just new to me. So um, here's the problem. They want to trade Betts and David Price. Mm-hmm. Kind of no matter what it sounds like. And David yeah. Price has $96 million remaining on his three years. In it, on his contract. And I think that's becoming a sticky point, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in the whole deal. Yeah. Plus, like you say, every time we talk about it, it there's a, there's a, a hot shot prospect in the discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lux with, the, with the Dodgers, he's the second overall prospect in, in minor league baseball right now. And I could see why yeah. the Dodgers wouldn't want to get rid of him, especially Absolutely. if they're going to be paying that much for David Price, who, is still a good pitcher. He's got quite a bit left in the tank, but I don't know how much yeah. he's going to go into 2022. Yeah. I think what's so. interesting is I wonder, and this is not in the reporting. Nobody's saying this that I've seen, but, um, but I wonder, Oh, I just forgot his name. The pitcher that went <laughs> from Boston to LA, uh, with the glasses that fought uh, Tyler Austin. Um, what? What's that guy's name? Kelly. Kelly. Joe Kelly. Thank you. Joe Frank. Kelly. Yeah. I I wonder how much <laughs> Joe Kelly is involved in this decision because they were teammates, and uh, yeah. you know I wonder if, you know if if they're breaking down some of the barriers there. I don't know. That's just what I've been thinking about. Yeah, I don't know. And and if I were Joe Kelly, I'd be petitioning for bets all day long, and probably <laughs> David sure. Price as well because. I mean, he's he's worked with him, and obviously, yeah. You know, everybody closely. knows that David Price is a is a great pitcher. But like I said, I don't know how much he has in the tank through twenty twenty two. So the Dodgers might not want to be be paying that much, and they're, uh, I guess you could say, notoriously frugal. Yeah, that's that's what I was just gonna say. They have the money. <laughs> yeah, they've they got do. it. They've got yeah, cap they space. That's not the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So right. we'll see what happens. So we have another. Another big thing happened this week. So Dusty Baker signed on to be the manager of the Houston Astros. Um, oh. <laughs> and <laughs> as a fan of another AL West team, I couldn't have been happier about that, um, oh, to be honest with you. <laughs> because, don't get me wrong. Dusty Baker had some great years in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. He led the, he led the Giants in the World Series in 2 but they ended up losing. He ended up losing his job. Went to the yep. Cubs. Eh, good, not great. You know, not the, great. The last year was not good. Sixty six and ninety six. Not that's not good. No. And then went to the Reds, where it's kind of not a great situation to begin with. And then, and then two years with the Nats got fired, and he wasn't in baseball the last two years at all. Two, two, count them. Yes. Yeah, he's been out of baseball for two years. Uh, he's seven. That's years longer old. than AJ Hinch's suspension. It is. Yeah. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, and and that's the thing too is you can't because they actually fired AJ Hinch. You can't think that they're just bringing in Dusty Baker for a year and then bringing AJ Hinch back. No, you know, that's not what that seems like. Because they could probably have brought him in in his spot for a year. Sure. And you know I'm sure he would have been fine with it, and then you know gone to some other position with the team after that. Yeah. But no, they've. They brought him in to to run things for the foreseeable future, and it'll be interesting to see how that goes. So one of the things that I love about Dusty Baker, and what is the same reason this is so interesting, is he is such an old school guy. 
so he old give school. he yeah oh as old as school gets man this guy mm-hmm. is is uh, he's aggressive he's in your face he's uh, he, he, the unwritten rules are big with him so I I just can't help but wonder like they went from AJ Hinch who showed that he's you know maybe doesn't have what it takes to stand up to his players and he's he's the cool have, dad he's the cool dad there you go. <laughs> He's the cool dad. And now they brought in grandpa or or the the tough uncle or something who's like he, this dude's going to swing the hammer if he has to. You know what I mean? He this guy will bench yeah. you if you uh if you look at him sideways. You know, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like yeah. he's going to run this like a fascist dictator. Mhm. Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll and, see. And kind of the thing too is if you look at if you look at his record, I mean he had two good teams, two very good teams with the Nats in 2016 and 17. They were 95 and 60, 95 and 67, 97 and 65. Went right. to the postseason, but just couldn't get over the hump. And uh, and you know, they, there's more talent in Houston. You know, they, they sure. I mean, anybody can run a. I want to say anybody, but he can carry the momentum of that team for a year at least. At, at least a year. I fully expect them to win the AL West again because they're that good. You know, the players are that good. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what will happen 2021. And I, I don't know either. And I don't think that's the point right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is okay. This is what I really think, right? I really do think that Dusty Baker is uh, a veteran manager, duh. And he has the ability to win. Um. He, he can at least get him over 500. I think the players oh, yeah. can carry the rest of that for sure. But mm. I think Houston needs the a good guy. They need to put the white hat on, right? Yeah, so they're going to yeah. bring they're going to bring Dusty Baker in because he's as good a swan song potential story as anybody. He's right. he he's as good as a like the Cinderella kind of idea as anybody. And so um you know, I think Buck Showalter would have done the same thing. If you look at the list of guys they they interviewed that were made public, they're all mm-hmm. like a number of them are this like, well, rise from the ashes, buddy, right? Like let's yeah, let's see what you can do. And this is just another the, to me, this is another sign of that. Right, and the other thing that those guys have in common too is they don't, they don't take any crap from anybody. None. Right? Like Dusty Baker said in his in his uh, introductory press conference, he said, there won't be any sign stealing on my watch. <laughs> yeah, there's not going to be a lot, <laughs> a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to have those, got to have those toothpicks all lined up the way he likes them. Um, yeah. Dot yeah. Ears, cross, your, <laughs> cross your T's, everything. <laughs> there will be hustle down to first base. So. There will definitely be hustle down to first base. Acuna <laughs> would not play for Dusty Baker. No, he wouldn't do well. Would not Neither would well. Gary Sanchez. He would struggle. <laughs> oh, yeah. He That's would struggle with that hustle. <laughs> yep. I said it. Yeah. You heard it here. Yeah. I'm not taking it back it either. <laughs> I said it and I don't regret it. <laughs> but. Yeah. All right. Should we go ahead and let's go ahead and take a quick break. When we get back, we're actually going to talk a little bit more about Nike uniforms. Hop yes. Up. No matter which ballpark you're at, you want to rep your team. Now you can with 9 Plus Us. Welcome to the Big City Series. With every design available in your team's colors, you can fit in with the home crowd or stand out on the road. Either way, we have the colors you crave. Shop the Big City Series and find designs that rep your favorite baseball podcast, cheer from the cheap seats, and much more. Shop the Big City Series only at 9plusus.com. Welcome back, baseball family. We're here. We're back. And we are going to talk to you about <laughs> uniforms. But before we do, Brad says he has a trivia question. Take it away, Brad. I do have some trivia. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I do have some trivia. Okay. Are you ready? No, but go. Go ahead. Send it. <laughs> so it's it's a this week in it's a this week in, in uh baseball history, okay? Oh, okay. So this week in baseball history we had the first Hall of Fame class voted in. Okay. Okay, it was 1936. It was uh, it was January 29th, 1936. Who were the five members 
voted in, Brig. The five members of the first class of Hall of Fame voting. Yep. You know what sucks <laughs> about being on video? <laughs> What's that? You can't see me cheat. <laughs> I'm sitting here like this. <laughs> Trying to Google it? Um, <laughs> wow. Okay. So I was telling Brad before we got started with this segment that I am terrible at baseball trivia. Just just <laughs> ugly bad. This is you filibustering on Google. <laughs> Shut up, Brad. <laughs> you take it back. No, I have no idea. I okay. Okay. Was there a hold on, answer me, riddle me this, Bat Brad. Was there a Okay. Was there a did they still have the ten year rule? Did they did was that a part of the first class? Um you know, I don't know. Because I don't know what that what year these guys everything. retired. That would change everything. Just throw throw a name out there. Who do you think would be one of the first guys the to babe be voted into the, the hall? The wimpy deer. The babe. Right? The babe. That wimpy deer. Yeah. 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 The great Bambi, ba- yep. ba- baby was... Ruthie. <laughs> <laughs> he was in in uh, that first class. Yeah. Okay. There's four more. Oh Are you ready? Oh my gosh! Yeah, just tell me, Brad. Just tell us. Okay. <laughs> so Ty Cobb. Oh, of course. Yep. Honus Wagner. Oh yeah, Walter Johnson. Yep. Yes. Yep. Seriously. Seriously, that was the next one I was gonna say. And and there's one more. Um, you're not gonna get it. Okay, you're not gonna okay, get it. Okay, fine. Christy Mathewson. Christy Mathewson. Yeah, I wouldn't have got that. Yep. You're right. Nope, wouldn't have gotten that one. But so. but those are like super duh names that you think I'd get. But now that I'm on the spot, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But yes, that that's like the list, right? Like what other. Yeah. What other year has there been a class like that? That's a great trivia question, Brad. Well, thank you. It's awesome. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Who's awesome? Okay. Can we talk about uniforms? <laughs> Let's talk about uniforms. So Nike, talk about the Nike treatment. Nike treat Nike's treating some some teams, bro. And I think yeah. it's awesome personally. I do, I do too. I do too. I love the Nike treatment. It is, I think baseball has been long overdue for the Nike treatment. I totally agree with you. Now, okay, we're going to get into what we love about it, but first let's pay tribute to the alternate argument. There are a lot of fans who are super angry about one feature in particular on Nike uniforms. Is There's a one uh-huh. and a half inch swoop logo right here. Right off of the right shoulder on the chest on every single uniform. Now, this is unheard of in baseball uniforms. Just unheard of. Right, because Majestic had it on the sleeve. And down or, below and the belt line. The... Yes. Yeah. So yeah. what do you think? Is this is this too much? Is Is it too... Is it distracting? Is it in your face? Is it, are you bugged by this? I think it's what it, you know what it is, is it's modern. Hmm. Because that's, that's true. That's how uniforms are now is, I mean, the NBA had Adidas in that spot for years. Yeah. Um, the NFL had Reebok in that spot for years and now they all have Nike in that spot. Uh, so, yeah. And except the Under Armour ones, but it's in the same spot. Right, yeah, and, and that's that's just the way that's just the way things are now, and You're eventually right. I'm sure we're gonna see advertisements on the jerseys. And I've heard people say, you know, get it off of there; it's not NASCAR. But honestly, though, it helps with re- revenue, right? I mean, sure. As much as I hate to say it, that's what it's about. Of course, and if it can supplement salaries for the players, and while also prevent like keeping. Uh, keeping ticket prices from skyrocketing. Right. I'm all for it. I don't even care because you can buy jerseys. You can buy jerseys without it. Um, the NBA sells their jerseys with or without the the advertisement patch on it. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like it's you're gonna get used to it. 
That's the way soccer, soccer, I sorry, soccer kits, soccer kits for anybody who likes soccer out there. Yeah, yeah. They've been like that forever. <laughs> it's been that way you forever know? in soccer. Yeah, and in fact, in soccer, you be the barely normal. know what team is playing. Oh yeah, because it's just a tiny little crest right on the breast. Yeah, everything else is paid for. Yeah. You, Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you're right. You you hardly know who the team is. Like for a long time, I thought that Manchester United was like, I think they were, um, uh, like O two or whatever. Yeah. The co- like what are they? The Manchester O two? Yeah. I don't know. You know, yeah. <laughs> so the casual fan doesn't know, but anybody exactly. else understands it, and understands why those why those change so much. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But no, I think it's just going to be the new way of baseball. It's the new way of sports. Uh, it's it's an it's the new normal. Interesting. Is really what it is. Interesting. What, what's your take on it? The one and a half inch logo is is okay with me right here. I think that's as far as I'm willing to allow. I think if we go into mm-hmm. full on paid advertising space on the players' uniforms, you know, we saw it on the side of helmets. I think last season, and uh, and I was like, uh, excuse me, uh, no, absolutely not. Yeah, it was. Was it? I want to say it was during the London series, and then there was a game yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. Right? Yep. And it was like yeah. whatever, I don't know, AT&T or Time Warner or something, some big telecom companies yeah. or some, one of whatever it was. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. offensive to me. I was bugged. But again, I'm the traditionalist. Right. And I will say, I, I think it looks weird on the helmets. I don't think they should put it on the helmets or the hats. If you're going to do it, put it on the jersey. Um, you've got you've got patches on the sleeves. Yeah. You do advertisement patches on the sleeves. Um, no. You can do, I mean, I'm just saying, if you're going to do it, yeah, I, I feel like that's a way to do it. I know, but come on. Because then just it's, don't it's do discreet it. and it can actually look kind of nice. No, no. I think you've got There's to, though. There's no way to. I'm telling you, it's. It's going to be the new normal, and if you've got to do it, make it look nice. I agree that if it's got to happen, let's be classy, let's regulate. has to be in the team's colors, mm-hmm. not the company's colors, stuff like that. Like, okay, we're going to put an overlay here of the Red Sox home jersey, white. Okay, it's got the blue writing with white outline, or with red outline, with red piping coming down the buttons. The swoosh is is red looks off to mm-hmm. me it just looks off to me i don't know why i don't know if mm-hmm. if i would prefer blue i don't know but for whatever reason it tilted the jersey uh to be too heavy red yeah, that's just my opinion um and and mm-hmm. they did it with they've done it that way with other teams where they take the t- one of the team's two bold colors and that's what the, that's what they're using in the stitch on the on the swoop so i mean mm-hmm. Is it terrible? No. Could it open the door for some terrible things? Yes, I think it could. And it is distracting right. visually for the fans. So I'm worried about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I not I don't hate the way it's gone with Nike, but I do I do worry about what it will bring in the future. So anyway, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, they just released them. Um, uh, Pittsburgh's new uniforms, and we'll put them over here. There's a couple of key differences. First is on their away jerseys and then their home alternates, the black ones. Um, they've got a scripted Pittsburgh across the chest. And it right. it looks yeah. sharp, I think. Yeah, it does. It does look sharp. Now, L.A. Dodger yeah. fans are angry because it looks a lot like the <laughs> Dodgers scripted jersey. And I think that's really interesting. And actually, we're seeing a pattern if you look at the Cincinnati Reds, New Jersey, they're scripted across the chest with the with the red, the alternate red, um, and so I just think mm-hmm. that that Nike's kind of in love with the script, the cursive font typeface. What do you think about this cursive thing, Brad? Um, it's old school. I mean that that's what it is. Yeah, you know, the the Dodgers. The only reason they have. I guess you could say "quote unquote" claim to it is because they haven't changed their their jersey in a hundred years. Yeah, you're right. You know that's 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 really the only reason the Reds have made changes, the Pirates have made changes, everybody else has made changes. Just about. Yeah, but just about that is old school, old school jersey writing. Um, I mean, growing up, uh, I've talked about how I played for a team called the Spartans. Mm-hmm. Our T-shirts 
were cursive like that. Cursive writing like that was like that swoop at the end. Yeah. Right? We talk about the the swoop logo on the hats and the t-shirts and, and stuff like that. Man, that's where that comes from. Yeah. It's, it's it's old school and they're going back to it. We have it on ours. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's on this, yeah. the 9 Plus Us logo right here. It's got the same swoop because yep. it, that's just the way it goes. And it's what you think of when you, yeah. th- you see that, you think of baseball. So I th- exactly, I think exactly it's awesome. Right. Now, what do you think of the hats? Okay, here's they've changed the hats at, in in Pittsburgh. Have you did you notice the change? The P, um, the P on the hats, the the little spikes, the little flares coming off the P. Oh yeah, they're much more pronounced, and I think there are four now. Mm-hmm. Yes, have there always been four? Yeah. Uh, you, I thought there was, but now that I'm looking at it, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't so. know for sure. Um, but it does look cool. That they're more pronounced. I do like that. I didn't notice it until you said there's a difference. Yep. Um, but no, I think it looks good. But I, I mean, in my eyes, though, I don't feel like you can do much wrong with the pirates, uh, just because they're pirates, and I love it. Right. For the record, but, I just looked it up. There have always been four kind of tines or spikes coming off the end. They're mm-hmm. just significantly yeah. more pronounced right now. That's all. But they look yeah. fabulous. Yeah, they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they really do. And the other thing with the Pirates uh, Pirates jersey and uniform change that I've that I noticed, and I don't know if they've been using this the whole time, but they're using the Pirate patch yep. on the sleeve, and it's fantastic. And instead of having, didn't he used to have like a red bandana? It used to be a red bandana. Yeah, and now it's, I don't know, now it's uh, Pittsburgh Pirates yellow. Which is what it should be. Yes, yeah. I think they're I think they're going away from any red now. Now, um which which is good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not good. It, it's fine. It's fine. I I didn't like the red. Now, one of the things Pit, one Pittsburgh is is one of the teams that's been excluded from this other trend that Nike's bringing in and that's this powdered baby blue. Now, this is a yeah. great color. It looks Awesome, and I think if a team can justify wearing this powdered blue, mm-hmm. you kind of have to. <laughs> yeah, so it's fantastic. So Toronto, the Blue Jays have introduced a new powdered blue or baby blue, whatever you want to call it, uniform into their uh, into their lineup for this year. They got the Nike treatment with powder blue, and it is stellar. It looks so good. It's amazing. I love it. Yep. It it could not be I, better. So last year the Mariners did kind of a powder blue or light blue during spring training. Yeah. And I really wish that they would have brought it in for the regular season. Maybe I'll get lucky and they'll do it for the regular season this year. But man, it looked it looked good. Yeah. It looked real good. And he, yeah, I agree with you. Anybody who can who can incorporate this into their uniform lineup, into their color scheme. Big fat yes. Now, this is also see a retro trend, right? This is another thing we're seeing mm-hmm. that we're hearkening back to the 70s and 80s, um, even into the 60s in some cases. And uh, we saw it last mm-hmm. year when Philadelphia went to powder, powder baby blue. And, yeah. whoa, man, in that maroon, phew, it is just yeah, that's sharp. Perfect. It's per- it's fabulous. And that that maroon really pops. The maroon really pops with the powder blue. I would love Looks to great. see the V-neck t-shirt come back. The V-neck jersey. I love it. That yeah, those are cool. They're not real great to play in, so I can understand why. I totally. like the button up. Yes. But but they look good and they're I'd buy one because I I'd totally wear it. Totally. Totally. We'll put a so. Side by side up on the video so y'all can see what we're talking about. But yeah, now the Diamondbacks, we're going to save those to the end, which is now. <laughs> 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 the Diamondbacks, I think, are in the running for the coolest new uniforms in Nike's sort of reign of glory or whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it. Um, they're, they're sticking with Sedona Red, which is mm-hmm. just absolutely flawless they've got the turquoise which again just could not be better but my favorite addition is they've got an alternate home jersey black sedona red writing turquoise outline and it says los d-backs oh yeah 
brilliant. And, you know, I saw... So I have a D-backs hat up here. Yeah. I don't know if it's in the shot, but I'm going to point to it. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. in the shot right now. I don't know if it is when I get in the screen, in the split screen. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to make an overlay so I, so you can see it. But the one that I have, I'll just grab it. The one that I have has the gold outline on the snake. Yeah. Okay. You can see it there. It's got that gold outline around the Sedona red snake. Um, and initially when I saw that they were, they were redoing some stuff with the D backs that they are, I guess being going to be more prominent with that turquoise. Yeah. I saw the snake instead of the gold outline, the turquoise outline. I was kind of like, Hmm, you know, that looks really, really good together. It does. <laughs> looks really good. And the one that looks like they're going to be wearing that, that color scheme with is, uh, it's their home white it says D backs and it has turquoise, uh, turquoise, uh, numbers and then it's got black black lettering with the uh, with the turquoise outline and I love it yeah it's a home alternate I it's love it it's awesome. so clean yeah it's it's amazing it's fantastic yeah and like you said I, I think the D-backs probably have some of the coolest uniforms in baseball and it's not close no no it's not I don't close. know who would be behind them now, so. those of you who are wondering what exactly is different we'll point them out with and we'll put the video or the imagery up but if you'll notice the shoulders no longer have that kind of gradient you know started solid up at the neck and then down the shoulders it became a dotted mm -hmm. sort of gradient there's no longer a gradient so it looks kind of like a mesh overlay yeah that was my first thought when i saw it it was supposed to be like snake scales but it looked like a mesh overlay yeah more than anything i don't know i i'm i'm not glad it's gone but it's cleaner this way no, I'm glad it's gone. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> like it to begin with. <laughs> it, it definitely looks a lot cleaner, a lot sharper. The colors pop better without it. That's true. Although, so my biggest issue here is they had an asphalt gray, like a really bold, dark gray mm -hmm. that they used to pair with that turquoise that's no longer there. And I'm a little sad mm -hmm. about that. I am too, because that did look really good. Yep. It, in fact, it was the oh, one of the best yeah. uniforms in all of baseball last year. Yeah, that asphalt color was great. I liked that. So, don't worry. We'll keep the asphalt so, T-shirt we have in the shop because it's that cool. Just, we have one. <laughs> it is. <laughs> we have one. <laughs> but I, I'm still such a I'm still such a big fan of that Sedona red. Yeah. That man. As long as they keep that, I'm I'm all in. I'm all in. Yeah. One hundred percent agree. Well, let's take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about one of our favorite documentaries on baseball. It's called Fastball. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never get back with me. Root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame, for it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Shop kids baseball shirts at 9plusss.com. Welcome back, baseball family. Like Briggs said, we're going to get into one of our favorite documentaries called Fastball. Now, I I got to tell you, I love, love this documentary. I watched it for the third time this week. Um, it's fantastic. I can't get enough of it. I learn something new every single time. Um, it's narrated by Kevin Costner. Um, oh. So you got, you got Crash Davis talking about fastballs. How great is that? It's awesome. <laughs> It's so awesome. I've seen this was my fourth time watching it as well. I just, oh, was it your fourth time watching it? Uh huh. I sit down oh, and man. watch it. I'm like, I ask people, I'm like, have you seen Fastball? Mm -hmm. They're like, no. And if they're any kind of baseball fan, I'm like, okay, sit down. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing right? What are you doing right now? <laughs> you want to watch it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but seriously, so right now though, it's like, on Amazon Prime for the, those of you who have Prime. It's, it's free on Prime Video. So. 
That's right. Now I'm, I'm going to put a video or a picture of it up so you can see exactly what to look for. I mean, granted, yep. you can just search it and find it that way. But, but anyways, so really what it does, it goes through, talks about the science of the fastball. Um, I guess pushing the, what, like the limit with human capability. Is that, is that what they talk about? I, I can't yeah, get that's the, right. That's essentially the, yeah, the crux is what is, what is possible. And we'll get into this, but what is possible for a pitcher physiologically and then what is possible for a guy at the other end trying to hit that fastball in you know mentally Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. oh it's so good (laughs) (laughs) well and they they do talk a little bit about the physics of it right because um because i can't remember who it was but somebody once said it might have been uh it might have been like hank aaron i think who said it's the hardest thing the hardest pitch to hit is a rising fastball now yeah they say that a fastball cannot go up. Okay. Physicists. That's Physicists what they say. say. Yes. Yeah. But I'll be honest with you, Brig. I I'm not sold. I mean, I know we have the stat cast and everything, you know, the pitch tracking that shows sure. us that a fastball will not go up. But man, I I had a buddy in high school who threw like had some wicked spin on his two seamer. Yeah. And I swear to you that thing went up. I swear to you I saw it go up at least once. Well, Hank Aaron was, in the documentary, oh go ahead, keep going, sorry. Oh, I was I was just going to describe what happened. So we were catching uh or I was catching just like regular uh they were doing bullpen but with li- with live hitting in the batting cage. Yeah. And so he threw this pitch, he threw his two-seamer and I I'm not kidding you, Brick. I was set up low and outside. Okay. And the ball was coming straight for my mitt. I was and I knew I was gonna catch it because he's a right hander. I was gonna catch it over my left my plan was to catch it over my left leg. It was gonna be right. it was gonna be back door two seamer was gonna start outside and run back over across the outside corner of the plate. I was prepared for where it was gonna stop because I caught that pitch from him. I'd been catching him for four years at this point. I caught him a ton. So I knew exactly what his two seamer was gonna do. But Brig, I'm not kidding you. It was coming straight for my glove where it was. The thing ran up and in and hit the kid in the elbow. Oh, ugh. like it it ran a foot and a half, and it wow. went up. I swear to you, it went up. It had to have gone up. Yeah, from what I saw. Now physics says, and what the, the way the physicist explained it in the documentary, probably right. what happened was it got some ride, right? Which means that it's not dropping at the same rate. Right. And it could have been just my eyes saying, this is where I'm expecting it to be. This is the the level that I'm expecting it to be at. But since it had some ride on it and some run to go with it, that it looked like it kind of swooped up. So but, Hank man. Aaron said he basically doesn't care what anybody says, that uh, he mm-hmm. has seen a baseball rise. So then mm-hmm. the documentary cuts to Justin Verlander who says, no, it's impossible. Baseballs don't right. rise. But, and Nolan and then Ryan. He, well, then Justin Verlander immediately goes, but it can ride. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, right. what the freak is the difference? And so he explains <laughs> it. I mean, the guy yeah. knows better than me. Sure, of course. But he explains what he means by ride. And then they go to Nolan Ryan, just like you were saying. And he's mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta definitely get some ride on it. And I think I think like looking back, that's probably what happened to that pitch was it got some ride. But at the same time, yeah. I mean a hundred years ago, physicists were saying that a curveball was just an optical illusion that the ball wasn't actually curving. Right. And we now know False. there was actual break Wrong. on that ball. A big one. Yeah. Yeah, you can get a real loop on a curveball. Because I think there was even a pitcher at one point who said, he, he can tell me it's an illusion all day, but I'll stand him behind a tree and I'll hit him with curveballs. Then yeah. he told me no, it's an optical illusion. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's I've so, never heard that. That's fantastic. <laughs> so so I, for a long time I was like, no, no, it, it'll go up because I saw it. Um, but after seeing the, expl- the explanation of ride and, um, like I said, pitch tracking, pitch tracing, yeah. Um, I'm I'm sure that's probably what happened, but man, the jury was out with me for a long time on that until I saw fastball. So you totally. will learn some things. You'll learn some physics. You'll learn some science about pitching during uh, during this documentary as well. You're also going to learn a lot about history, and that's the coolest part for mm-hmm. me is this kind of the history and the culture. 
Those are my big things. And so mm-hmm. the the f- one of the first people to ever have their pitch tracked was was Bob Feller. Actually, everybody mm-hmm. knows who Bob Feller is. And if you don't look it up, great pitcher. Uh, Hall of Fame pitcher. So Bob Feller, 1946, which was 74 years ago, by the way, he threw 98.6. Um, now here's the thing, and and was it uh, was it Walter Johnson was the other one that they so Walter Johnson threw a pitch and he raced a motorcycle, and then Bob Feller threw a pitch and they did it through an army contraption they call it where mm-hmm. the the pitch is seven feet but the the cage that he throws it through breaks wires and that triggers the the timer and then the timer tracks it all the way until it hits a metal plate past the end and this is how remington tracked uh feet per second on the on a muzzle right on on rounds exiting rifles so they they got it set up for him and and bob feller threw 98.6 miles an hour according to that test now, now that was seventy four years ago in nineteen forty six. It was proven later in the show that maybe he threw even a little faster. And that's a tease. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and the other thing to think about when you when you look at that test is that um, they place that the first part of the contraption, those wires, they place that at sixty feet six inches. So that's yeah, where right. that's where the ball is going to cross the plate, and then they had that metal plate 15 feet behind that. Yes. So if you're throwing, I mean, even if he's throwing 100 miles an hour or 98 or whatever, he's going to lose considerable velocity by the time it gets to, uh, gets to that back plate, especially if well, those wires. And like they said, it measured seven feet beyond the, where the batter is standing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you have to back it up and then you have to account for the today's standards, which we'll get into because, and let's, let's do it right now. So this first contraption started we effectively measured the pitch seven feet behind the batter but today Mm -hmm. they measure the ball's velocity 10 feet in front of the rubber on the mound it's 10 feet away and so it's basically the moment it leaves the pitcher's hand they tracked it that's how that's what they measure Mm -hmm. yeah and and with that you know you get Araldis Chapman who has the right. fastest official pitch thrown at 105.1. Yep. Gas. That's some gas. Then, what's that? Yeah, that's gassy. That's Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. It you is. See what I did there. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> but but so you've got that with with Chapman, but then they also like you said, they they kind of take into account the distance of where things are measured and do some physics and math and all kinds of numbers and things like that. They come up with some other numbers uh, for what I guess you could kind of propose as the uh, as the actual velocity of those pitches. Do, you, I mean, do we want do to get we, into that or we want to leave that a mystery? Well, I think we should leave it a mystery. I think we should encourage people to go watch the documentary and find out for themselves mm-hmm. because the documentary is, is gripping. I, f- I found it mm-hmm. uh, just mesmerizing. Yeah. Well, even my wife, we were, I was sitting there watching it and, uh, and she was doing some other stuff. Like she's, she's doing some cleaning and, and like folding laundry and stuff while I was working on some stuff while I was watching it. And she ended up just like coming and sitting on the end of the bed and, and watching it with me and, and got hooked because it's, yeah, it is that gripping. I'm not surprised. And the way they build out the, the sequencing of the information is just stellar. So some of the people you'll see in the documentary, Andrew McCutcheon, Justin Verlander, David Price, Hammer and Hank Aaron. Um, they talk about people like Honus Wagner and Sandy Koufax and Bob Feller and Goose Gossage is in there. They open mm-hmm. with Goose Gossage. And, and Goose it's like... Is, Goose Gossage oh. is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, I I'm always kind of upset that they lead with him because he's so good. He has such good material, but then at the same time, he's a great hook. He's a great, he's a great he's, hook. He's so entertaining. He does such a good job. He is his own caricature. He's a caricature he of himself, and it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. Um, my favorite thing that he says, I got to, I got to share this. My favorite thing that he says is people, he says that people meet him off the field. They meet him when he's out walking around and like, Oh, you're not anything like you were on the baseball field. He says, no, if I walked around like that all the time, they'd lock me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought yeah. That was good. I thought that was good. One of the thing, one of my favorite parts of the documentary is when they like right in the middle of everything, they break down what exactly the difference is between 92 mile an hour fastball and a 100 mile an hour fastball. And the the people they get on there that talk about it, like Brandon Phillips is one of them. He's all star second baseman. He says Mm -hmm. um, at 92, you can basically read the MLB logo and you can count the stitches stitches in the baseball. He said, but at a hundred, it looks like a golf ball. Mm -hmm. That's amazing difference. It, it is, and I, I totally believe it with that with that amount of difference because that's insane. Um, they, they said that they said that they, so if you track them side, side by side, a hundred mile an hour pitch and a 92 mile an hour pitch, it by the time they've thrown at exactly the same moment, by the time the 100 mile an hour pitch reaches home plate, reaches the strike zone. The 92 mile an hour pitch has four and a half feet remaining on the travel distance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, four and a half and I, feet. <laughs> I know, I know. When they That's asked like, them, they what? Said, I can't remember who said it, but they asked one of the guys when they, you know, when they were first posing that question, they said, "What's the difference between a hundred mile an hour fastball and a 92 mile an hour fastball?" I can't remember who it was, but he says, "Home runs." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a home run. <laughs> Which, yeah. like, if you're not used to that kind of speed, like, even a 92-mile-an-hour fastball is fast. It'll mess you up, yeah. The, the average person, it'll get up on you fast, it'll be gone before you know what happened. But for those guys to say that 92 is that much slower than 100, that's saying something, because 92 is still is still pretty fast if you're not used to it. Totally. They said, oh. so a 100-mile-an-hour fastball gets to home plate in 396 milliseconds, which is faster than you can blink. Yeah. I'm like, what? Mm. Like, my brain doesn't even have room for that information. (laughs) I can't even envision a a, a situation where, you know what I mean, where I got to think that quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, And if you've been at a game, if you've been in a major league or minor league game where somebody's throwing like that, that's... You, I mean, you've kind of seen it. You know that the ball is yeah. basically just a blur. You see the pitcher wind up, stretch, and go through his motion. Next thing you know, you hear the pop of the glove. Yeah, yeah. They I, say I can't that. Imagine. Yeah. They say that it sounds like a shotgun uh, when you know in the bullpen when they or at the catcher's mitt when it hits it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it really does. Yeah, it's, it really does. It's something else. But it's special, that, man. <laughs> that that kind of gas when it's being thrown. Uh, one one of my other favorite lines from that whole thing is it's it's very early. It's got to be within the first five minutes. They ask everybody, "What does a fastball sound like?" Or can you hear a fastball? And Derek Jeter says, "Yeah, it sounds yeah. like trouble." Yeah, that's right. That was Derek Jeter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, "You bet it does." You hear that thing coming at you? Shoop. Yeah, not even. You know. <laughs> Just, it sound like a buzz saw, you know. It does. You, you can hear it. You know it's coming. You know it's trouble. Yeah, I thought that was Ugh. a perfect description of, of a fastball and what it sounds like. But there's one guy that they talk about who um, was actually somebody I've never heard of. A lot of the guys on the on the documentary, like the younger guys, had never heard of him, and I thought I thought he was interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. Go ahead, Steve Dalkowski. Okay, he spent spent several years in the minor leagues. Uh, the big thing was that they they never he never got to the big leagues, um, because he had control issues, and they said he was fine left and right. He could throw the ball over the plate, but the problem was up and down. Right. And what they said, and this goes back to that rising fastball argument. They said that he threw so hard and put so much backspin on the ball that it would like it would just go up. They said, try to throw it a foot in front of the plate and it would end up over the catcher's head because it had like that, I guess, extra ride and it would go up, go up on him because of all that backspin. And you know, like I said, the jury's kind of out on that, whether that's what really happened or he just was that wild up and down. But, um, but they, a lot of guys were saying he, because he, he's a legend, you know, he's legendary. There's no video of him because he never made it to the bigs. Um, 
but everybody they asked said he threw harder than any, anybody they've ever seen ever. Yeah. Freaky hard, right? Freaky hard. Yeah. Yeah. Freaky hard. And then eventually, you know, he sounds like he, uh, he, I think that sounded like he tore his UCL from what it sounds like. Yep. Um, Something like the, that. The ligament. Yeah. The ligament you end up having Tommy John on, he tried to come back and, and, uh, just wasn't ever ma- ever, ever able to make it. And so that's why a lot of people don't know about him. Right. But among ball players who played around him, he was, was legendary, legendary yeah. because of that fastball. It's an amazing documentary. And I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, when they finally drop the final punchline, mm-hmm. because let me, let me, let me drop one more piece of information on you. When they mm-hmm. tested Bob Feller and, uh, and some of these other guys, they did it without being in an actual game, a live game scenario. And right. so they're talking, they're talking to these guys and they're saying, okay, throw this against a motorcycle, right? The beat the motorcycle to the paper and throw it as hard and as fast as you can. That's that's a different scenario than it is pitching in a, you know a live game. But when mm-hmm. they yeah. when they compare them to a Roldis Chapman and all the others, and they kind of normalize the circumstances as best they can, man, there's really only a couple of things that that get in the way. Oh man, that's all I can tell you. You got to just go watch it. You do have to go watch it, and you'll be surprised. And I'll say this: you'll be surprised by some of those numbers at the end of the at the end of the doc. Yeah, because there's a couple shocking numbers there, and uh, it's totally worth it. It's worth the watch. It's about an hour and a half long. Uh, I want to yep. say it's hour and twenty six minutes. Uh, like we said, you'll find it on Amazon Prime. Fantastic watch. Go watch it uh, as soon as you finish listening or watching. Yeah, just go jump on there and watch it. While you're at it, but before you leave your computer, go on to 9plusus.com. We've got it set up now where you can just spell out 9, N-I-N-E. So just go to 9plusus.com. That's where we have all the shop, all the merchandise on the shop. Here's the official hoodie for the podcast. This is our Baseball Together hoodie. You can get this wonderful print right here. The sweatshirt. What did I say? Oh, you said hoodie. I've got my sweatshirt on. Oh, you've got your sweatshirt. Oh, okay. <laughs> You can get this wonderful print right here. We've got art. We've got pillows, hats, and more hats are coming. Be freaking excited. <laughs> That's right. Ew. Yeah. We'll also, we're also, okay. as soon as we get a little closer to the season, we're going to start doing podcast listener-only discounts. So stay tuned That's for right. that, too. That's right. And you can also check us out on BaseballTogether.com. Uh, you can watch the podcast there. You can listen to it. There's a little podcast listening tool available on the side there. You can also read about baseball. Um, we we keep talking about how it's our goal to build out that content more, but we're prom- we promise we're, we're going to do that for you. Brig has the last thing up on there. As far as reading goes, he wrote an article about what he would have done if he was commissioner, how he would have punished the Astros and sent down his fury upon them. <laughs> Um, but you can also check us out on Instagram. We're going to have more of an Instagram presence presence as well at baseball together or, or search nine plus us as well. Don't forget to like subscribe, rate, review the podcast. You can find us on all of your favorite podcast platforms and YouTube as well. And baseball family, we will catch you next week.